we should push more towards open source models and open source software to allow anyone to develop their own large language model, as well as for the small companies to be able to build something new on top of their data to compete with the big companies. And welcome everyone to Slater Pod. Today, very excited to have Nikola Nikolov on the podcast. So Nikola is a researcher and engineer in natural language processing and machine learning uh, with a PhD uh, in NLP from ETH Zurich and years of experience in applying NLP to enterprise problems. He also runs a YouTube channel at the Global NLP Lab and, and the website as well. So uh, hi, Nicola, and thanks for joining today. Happy to be here, Florian. Excited to talk to you about NLP and language technology. Great, thanks. So are you in Zurich today or are you in another part of the world? Yes, I'm in Zurich. We could have done this in, in, in person. Exactly. You, you too? You're also in Zurich? Yeah, I'm also here. But hey, look, the the setup is easier if we do it uh, if we do it remote. But anyway, next time we'll do it in person. So yeah, great. Th thanks for having me. And maybe I should also say a few words about me. Uh, I mean, yeah. So as you as you said, I have been working in NLP now for for seven years, and uh, I've been involved in research um, during my PhD and and now as well. And also, I'm currently working at a startup. Um, focusing on edtech, and I'm also doing some consulting as well. Um, for those of you interested in talking to me, you can check out my website at nlplab.tech. And I'm very excited about natural language processing, machine learning, and the power it has to impact the world. So happy to be here again. Absolutely, yeah. So we, you know, we're trying to unpack all of these latest advances, which were so fast and furious with the large language models, you know, of course, Nero Jet GPT and all these other models. So we we needed to bring experts on and uh, and and to to discuss this and make sense. But before that, um, tell us, you, uh, I noticed you're using Synthesia for your YouTube channel. Uh, just uh, you know, Synthesia was on the podcast as well. We we talked about the company in the past as well. Just tell us about this because it's a nice mix of kind of NLP and, uh, and, and and kind of applied NLP in terms of the text output. So tell us a bit more about that and why you uh, chose to use that for your YouTube channel. Definitely, yeah. So I've been doing YouTube, focusing specifically on natural language processing topics for the last couple of years. I started off doing the videos myself, but I came across Synthesia uh, a few months ago and I gave it a shot and I realized that actually I'm able to make videos several times faster with Synthesia. Um, so I'm able to, to uh, produce many more videos uh, and also they look quite, quite professional too. So, um, and, um, so we're, we're, I think it's really great, great tool. Um, what I'm doing is I'm actually having my own avatar as well. Um, I record it, uh, then they now offer the option if you have a paid subscription to record like two or three minutes videos of yourself. And then they can create an avatar of yourself uh, automatically, which you can use to to embed in your videos. So um, it's really a great, great help. Helps me, helps me do a lot more. I watched it and then initially I'm like, is that, is that like, it just, you know, I, I, I noticed it wasn't like fully live, but it took me, a, it took me a minute or so to understand, oh yeah, this is, this is your avatar on Synthesia. So uh, anyway, great way to, to do a lot of uh, YouTube output. So get us started on uh, your views on kind of large language model and the state of natural language processing today. Kind of lay the landscape here for us uh, over the past maybe six months, but also going back a bit further. Definitely, yeah. So I think we are actually at the moment at a very, very interesting time in terms of AI. Um, so we have seen some really impressive use cases and demonstrations of AI in particular, large language models, talking specifically about NLP and language technologies. Um, well, actually, the technology itself, language models, is quite old one. Uh, the first statistical language models date back to the 80s already. And we have seen some neural language models being released already in the beginning of the early 2000s. But now it's kind of a very interesting situation. Um, and we have seen technologies such as ChatGPT, large language model APIs released by various players such as um, OpenAI, um, Cohere, uh, 
anthropic and maybe i should say it. so i think my my interpretation of this is that um so the, the technology the core technology itself is not new but we have seen some pretty amazing advancements in the last few years which has made it possible to get to the current uh, fluency levels of those language language models and here there's like a few things that come to mind in particular one is the uh, scale of the models so the small language models in the past were much smaller in terms of capacity in terms of number of parameters as well as in the amount of training data they had seen LLMs like GPT-3, GPT-4, ChatGPT have hundreds of billions of parameters. I think for GPT-3 it's about 173 and for GPT-4 it's not really known, but it's about 1 trillion parameter are the speculations out there. And also those models are trained on hundreds of, uh, like huge amounts of gigabytes of raw text. This is one component that makes a huge difference to me as compared to what was in the past. Um, and um, another component perhaps is the architecture of those models. Um, so previous models were relying on like statistical models were just based on co-occurrence statistics. So basically predicting the uh, kind of like using engrams um, of, of words to predict the next word. Uh, like sequences of words um, and we, go, we got to the deep learning revolution in the last 10 years and now we're using transformers which are the best architecture we've had so far for doing this sort of language modeling too so th that also has made an impact um, and uh, the transformer based language models are much better at handling long range long range dependencies they're easier to train um, in some some sense than previous architectures and yeah so the architecture is also a component that's making a difference right now that we're seeing this explosion of large language models um, and finally a component that is very very important as well and also it's has been more recent is the, our capacity to fine-tune these models on human data so the base language models up to uh, 2020 or so, for example, GPT-3 released in 2020 by OpenAI, uh, GPT-3, yeah, that one um, was only trained using the raw data sets available on the internet. So like stuff like the whole of Wikipedia, um, all, all possible web pages they were able to get their hands on pretty much. But now what's interesting in the last especially in the last, um, since the introduction of ChatGPT or so, is the introduction of fine-tuning on human data sets um, or the so-called reinforcement learning from human feedback, which what they have shown is that it better aligns the large language models to human expectations. So it, it really gives this really great capacity of the language models to understand what we want what is the goal of uh, what sort of request we have we want to achieve and it enables the large language models to kind of like uh, follow this instruction and produce something that is actually useful something that is related to what we want to get and for previous models from two three years ago even though they were large they were not really able to to do that to the same capacity so all of those things combined together has led to the current state where we have really powerful um, chatbot dialogue like models like chat gpt um, gpt4 they're able to do a lot more than the past it's really remarkable um, what they can do of course it, of course they have as well various limitations and this has led to the very interesting situation where, where we are at the moment um, as we have talked before with you in the past, there's like an explosion of various uh, startups using this technology um, in various capacities, either building foundational technology or building applications on top of it. And we're also seeing, interestingly, the big companies are really jumping on board really, really quickly as well. Like we have seen a lot of releases of prototypes by really big companies. Um, so that has been very interesting. To watch as someone who has been also um, doing this for a while, uh, this speed has been very exciting too. 
how much of a uh, how big of a deal how big of a deal do you think is GPT four in a technology from a technology point of view in the grander schemes of like large language models? Is it mostly kind of first to market, and they were just uh, bolder in coming out with something that maybe a big company like Google would have been a lot more hesitant to to launch in the market? Or do you think they actually have a kind of a a lasting technological edge, at least like for the next, let's say, six to 12 months? Uh, that's, I guess, what I mean by lasting, because I, I don't think they have anything in the next maybe five, six years. But like, how big of a deal is it now in terms of the technology? And you, you mentioned that reinforcement learning by human feedback, uh, maybe they had like a, they were kind of behind the curtain, they were doing a lot of this reinforcement learning by human feedback for m months and months, and now everybody else is trying to catch up. But do you think they're going to catch up relatively quickly, or do you think uh, GPT or ChatGPT and OpenAI have a lasting advantage over the next year or two? That is a good question. Um, in, terms of Chat G uh, in, in terms of GPT-4 specifically, we actually don't really know a lot about it, so there's not a lot of details released to the public. There's only um, a few details outlined in a blog post and like a report by OpenAI, but we don't really know fundamentally whether there has been major advances or not, to be fair. And my, my kind of gut feeling into this is that the main advances have been in terms of scaling the existing systems. They have changed the training data set, perhaps cleaning up a little bit better. They have increased the data set of that was used to train the model on human feedback. They have increased the model size. They have increased the training time of the model as well. Uh, speculations around are that has been trained several several times, many more epochs than previous models, which of course helps the model to to learn better, to better memorize and distill the training patterns much better from the large corpus that it's using. So in terms of the competitive landscape and what will happen, it is quite difficult to predict, to be honest, what will happen. Um, my gut feeling there would be that um, the, the technology behind um, OpenAI fundamentally is open source. We don't know all the details, but a lot of it is open source. And Google is a very big company, so they have a lot of resources, a lot of researchers that are very well trained. And I'm sure that they'll be able to put together um, something that will be able to compete with GPT-4 fairly quickly. There are a lot of tricks. So OpenAI has some advantages. Mainly they have been doing this type of work for quite a few years now, specifically focusing on large language models. There might be some technologies, mostly in terms of how they train them, um, in terms of internal software, in terms of tools, how to train them and how to deploy in them, there might be some advantage more on that side um, from OpenAI. Um, but in terms of replicating it, I, th I think it's possible to get something similar. And also maybe even open source models, we're going to see more and more coming out that are closer to, to GPT-4 over the coming months. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, that answer is the question. Who are the key players? I mean, we had Nick Frost from Cohere on the podcast, actually before the whole ChatGPT, uh, you know, craze started. So, uh, uh, so we have Cohere, we have OpenAI. You mentioned Anthropic just before the Stability AI. There's, I guess, Google with Bard now. I mean, it's kind of hard to keep track, but I guess those would be called the foundation models, right? And then, is there anybody you would want to add to that? And then, like. Tell us what is a foundation model, because we're afterwards. I want to get your thoughts on like building on top of these. But first, I would like to understand: okay, what's a foundation model, and who's in that space? So, a foundation model is basically a uh, the base large language model that can then be used for various downstream applications through the prompting um, that people are quite used to nowadays. And basically, the foundation model is a large language model. Uh, that has been trained to be like a general purpose model. Um, and, and then it can be accessed by anyone through an API or directly as well. If you're a big company like Google, you want to have basically this base pre-trained model that's useful for 
whatever you want to do. Let's say in the case of Google, maybe you want to integrate it into Google Docs. Maybe you want to integrate it into Google Meet to do meeting summarization and various similar use cases. And yeah, as you mentioned, there's quite a few uh, players providing this foundational lang language model as APIs. Growing a number, um, it's quite tough to uh, keep track indeed. And all of them have slightly different models. They, they basically, they, they differ in terms of the training data that they use, and also in terms of the human feedback data too. I think all of them, to a certain extent, uh, do what OpenAI, trying to mimic what OpenAI is doing in terms of training on human feedback data, like R the RLHF, reinforcement, le reinforcement learning from human feedback type of fine tuning. Where does the foundation models like kind of end and where does like somebody building on top start? Like for example, recently I saw Bloomberg has its own LLM now. So would that also be considered a kind of foundation model, but only trained on like, you know, a ton of Bloomberg data or would that already be on somebody else's kind of framework or like, I'm just trying to understand kind of the pyramid. What's like at the, at the foundation of the pyramid and then going up and people building on top of it. So for example, if you've seen the, the Bloomberg example, what would that be? That is also a foundation language model that has been kind of pre-trained on a lot of financial data. And the idea there is that basically Bloomberg can take this model and then they can apply it to various use cases they might have internally focusing on, for example, summarizing uh, financial news articles um, or using it to predict the markets or something similar. So basically the foundation model finishes where a specific use case starts where you want to kind of like take this model and really max it out, like optimize it for this specific use case that you wanna get a high, uh, high accuracy on. And would that be, um, so would you have to be a company of the size of Bloomberg to want to do this at the foundational model as opposed to, all right, now I use, I don't know, GPT-4 and kind of build something on top or I use, or I build something on Cohere. Like what, what types of enterprise size do you need to, or data kind of, um, well, pool of data do you need to want to build this for like on your own? In terms of replicating like a model like GPT, um, that is very, very difficult to do. It requires a lot of funding, like several millions at least to kind of replicate this model. And this might be necessary because what people have shown is that to get really the most out of this foundation models, to get them to the level where they really start to become really useful, you kind of need to get to uh, a scale that is at least 50 to 100 uh, billion parameters. And basically getting to this level is very, very difficult unless you are like have very, very well funded startup or a very big company. For most people, therefore, uh, where they should focus their efforts on is looking at existing pre-trained uh, foundation models, seeing, seeing if they can fine tune them for the specific use case or calling directly the APIs similar to, to GPT. And, uh, doing stuff like prompt engineering, or also those APIs offer the option to fine tune directly on the platform. Um, and we're gonna see a lot more of those services coming up in the next couple of months and years, offering companies the option to fine tune their own foundation language model um, checkpoint, which they can directly integrate into their products. Very interesting, huh? And so, yeah, you're mentioning like building on top of these now. So I'm seeing a lot of front ends, like with GPT now, with uh, with OpenAI, anybody who gets their hands on kind of an, an API is, well, is building some type of front end. Um, so is that really the kind of major explosion now that like a lot of people are taking this and trying to kind of get a quick win in terms of building some type of front end, getting in a few subscriptions? Or what type of businesses are you seeing now kind of very early on in having an API available to, to a lot of these, you know, Cohere and OpenAI or what type of businesses are being built now? Like, I know there's hundreds or thousands, but like, if you can, do you see a trend already emerging? Yeah, the impact in general of these foundation models for sure will be huge. Um, 
in the industry and in various use cases. It is a very interesting question to think about well, which companies are going to be successful at the end, let's say in a year from now. Right now we're seeing a lot of um, movement basically across the board. So big companies are integrating those foundation models. Um, a lot of startups are coming up which are exploring novel use cases of them. For example, writing assistance or summarization is a very big use case. I'm sure there will be a lot of applications as well in the uh, uh, tr machine translation or cross-lingual type of services too. And currently, um, we can talk about that if you would like in terms of how I see this. It's tough to predict, of course. I think that now is a very interesting time. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, currently, I actually see this uh, in terms of winners. They will be like... Uh, a part of me is a bit, of, a little bit skeptical. Um, a part of me is also seeing the opportunity. Um, actually, I see that the big companies are going to be major winners for sure out of the situation. Companies like Google and Microsoft already they're integrating these models into their products. Microsoft announced uh, Copilot co for Office. I don't know if you saw that one, which basically um, is giving you the access of ChatGPT-like functionality directly within Office, within Excel, within Word, within Teams. You'll be able to generate um, emails, content, whatever you want, images within Microsoft directly. And so th this will be a major win. And But at the same time, um, um, yeah, so, so these big companies, for sure, there's going to be a big impact um, that I see. At the same time, there's a lot of those small startups popping up that are trying to use the APIs um, to build writing assistants um, and various other tools. There, I find it a little bit more difficult to say which one will be successful or not. And um, especially because many of them are very similar, they just call the API. And uh, there, there I, I, in my opinion, there will be a lot of companies that will not make it, unfortunately because they will not be able to bring an edge um, over products like Microsoft's Copilot, which already has a large user base, basically can, can be a writing assistant, it can generate um, whatever copy you want, talking about, for example, advertisement materials or uh, material for your website, blog posts, it can do that too. So it's a question of what will happen with all of those hundreds of startups that are popping out at, at the moment in this space. And um, um, there is opportunity there too for products to, to, to come out. Um, however, um, there it's getting more difficult. And I think there the, the, the companies that really make it will be companies that are bringing in something new that differentiates them from, from Microsoft and the big companies. This could, be, this could come up uh, in terms of data sets that they might be able to collect. Uh, it might come out also in terms of novel use cases that are very niche and are not really interesting, interesting for the big companies. Um, maybe also in terms of new technology, although, although that's very difficult for smaller players to bring in, as I mentioned, because uh, developing cutting-edge foundational language models or NLP is becoming increasingly more difficult unless you are very well funded as a, as a startup. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how, how I see it. And also, one segment of companies that will for sure be successful is actually going to be the uh, companies that are bringing in foundational technology, um, both in terms of the hardware and the software. So companies like NVIDIA, for sure, are going to profit from the whole generative AI uh, situation and large language models because everyone needs to be using GPUs to run those foundational language models as well as companies like OpenAI um, or Cohere, there will be a lot of interest in general from small, medium-sized, and even large companies to use those APIs directly, especially companies who don't have the capacity or the motivation to develop those technologies further themselves. Uh, they might want to want to uh, just call an API and bring in some AI-like features to their products. And they will have to do this as well if they want to remain competitive because all of those startups are going to 
come up with the same product but using the API. And those medium-sized companies offering, for example, it could be also a translation, a translation company, um, they can just implement those same features easily by calling the API themselves. And like that, they already have the user base. Um, they'll be able to, to basically potentially put out smaller companies out of business in the, in the future. You put out a post uh, in, in the Global NLP Lab also about the limitations of kind of the API-only approach, right? I mean, you touched on some of the limitations already, but maybe let's just go through this quickly again. Again, from a startup point of view, you're just relying on the API and you're building a front-end. What are some of the limitations that you listed in that, in that piece? One major limitation of just calling an API is that you don't have a model that is fine-tuned to your specific domain and your use case of interest. So let's say you're focusing on an application use case that is targeting biology. The API approach is going to be basically limited to what the model has learned from the, um, hundred, for the, for the tens of hundreds of gigabytes of data of biology it has uh, basically seen from Wikipedia and similar sources on the internet. However, the model has also seen not only biology documents, but also, let's say, financial data, um, news articles, um, various topics unrelated to what you're trying to achieve. So a model fine-tuned on biology will, uh, of course, always outperform a model fine-tuned on the whole of the internet. And this is one limitation that you cannot really easily get a model that is specialized to your specific really narrow domain and application that you want to target with APIs. So that's something to consider if you're looking into using uh, APIs directly for your use case. I think there's a big value in using APIs to put together quickly application prototypes. And at the moment as well, there's still like a buffer period, like if you want to make a startup or so in this space, there is a possibility, I think, still to put together a very powerful product. Nobody has thought about this. Um, and But quickly, you need to basically collect, in my opinion, custom data sets, and you need to think about, okay, what will be the next step? What will happen? Because what will happen is you're going to have 10, 20 more companies, both small startups and big startups, which might have data that you don't have access to, which will fine-tune the model and will be able to outperform you uh, on long term. So that's one, one, one thing to consider, no specialization. Another one is the lack of differentiation uh, that you will have if you're just calling an API. So if you are, want to get investment for your startup, a question is going to come up, of course, like what do you bring to the table? Do you just have an interface and you're just calling this API and, okay, magically, is, is it going to work on long term? Probably not uh, because... You don't really have nothing that basically uh, keeps you uh, on the edge um, compared to the competition, compared to the hundreds, potentially other companies in the same space as you that could just do, might be doing something slightly different, but they might just decide to integrate an API themselves and target the same use cases, use case you are targeting. And if they do that, basically you will be out of business. So this is one thing to consider uh, for sure if uh, for someone who is looking into using this technology as a core business uh, strength that they want to um, have. And the final thing to keep in mind too, by that if you're just calling an API, you don't really have um, ownership of the technology. So in that sense, you don't really understand what precisely is going on in the background. You cannot really give precise guarantees to your customers regarding what they can expect. You uh, also might have issues like privacy um, as well as uh, various, various yeah, privacy or data type of concerns. You cannot really give promises that what, you, what your users are providing to your app how it's being treated and how it's being processed by those API providers. So basically you're having limited flexibility as well when you're using the APIs for uh, as a key component in your uh, business. Now talking about privacy, uh, literally a couple of days ago, Italy 
Bain, ChatGPT, right? Mostly around privacy, I think, concerns were, were the key reasons. I mean, what's your kind of hot take on this? Like, is this a start to a kind of a what much wider ban or limitation to these models? Or is that just Italy blazing the trail and, and staying alone? I don't know. Definitely, there's a lot of concern, a lot of discussions going on. Um, for example, within universities or within governments, I'm sure about the impact of this technology it might have. Because I also heard on the internet someone mentioning that basically a lot of employees from big companies are throwing a lot of data in ChatGPT and using it for various use cases. And I think companies are starting to be increasingly more aware about this. So thinking about, okay, what is the impact of this? So basically, will the OpenAI team get access to our proprietary data? Will they be able to somehow reverse engineer or use this? And I mean, I think we're moving in the right direction. Also, OpenAI have been strengthening their stance towards this. For example, they are saying that they will no longer be using uh, data from those, from ChatGPT and from the APIs to improve their core API offerings. But at the same time, I mean, there's a lot of API providers. There's a lot of a lot more transparency that needs to be uh, provided if those foundational models want to be used in uh, in big companies where data data sensitivity is a prime prime concern. And for example, things like banks or other institutions, let's say legal uh, law firms, they have very very strict requirements and concerns about this. Um, there's also an opportunity, perhaps we're going to see a lot a foundational language model company showing up that is specifically targeted towards that. And also it opens up opportunity in, in terms of the companies that are offering dedicated capacity for, for them coming in in-house and building you, your own um, foundational language model, fine-tuned to your data, um, which you have yourself internally and you can use I'm sure that we're going to have a lot more companies in that space as well. I have seen I have seen quite a few actually. Yeah, we're working on on we we actually piloting on a project there, uh, where we give all of our data and now we're trying to get kind of a, a an answer box that's specifically trained on on all of our content. So so maybe it's more of a temporary issue. Just people, I mean, Italy is concerned about you know, all of the personal data that it was A, maybe trained on and B, that, that people are inputting there. But I'm sure that's going to get worked out over the next, you know, year or two. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm sure. Who knows? I I guess it will. Now, uh, let's talk about LLMs and machine translation, specifically machine translation, this being um, a podcast that's centered around the language industry. Um, very stupid question. Why wouldn't an LLM the size of ChatGPT not like massively outperform any other machine translation model? It's like trained on everything and every possible input. It has a trillion parameters or however many it, it does, like just so, so much. Like it's competitive and we've covered this, but it's not like massively outperforming. It, it doesn't seem to obviate the need for more narrower models. Why is that? And no, that's number one. Number two, like, well, maybe first, how does it translate at all? Like, is, is is that fundamentally different from the machine translation, the neural machine translation models we're currently using, or is it kind of the same fundamental approach to it? So actually, um, GPT-4 has made quite a big advancement in that space, not specifically about machine translation, but in terms of multilingual use cases. Actually, uh, one interesting result that they report in the blog post GPT-4 is that um, GPT-4 across 40 languages outperformed GPT-3.5 on English on a narrow question answering benchmark. So it seems that the foundation, foundation models, especially trained on large amounts of multilingual data, are powerful and they, are, they, they do hold potential to uh, basically unlock various NLP use cases in the low resource languages. In terms of machine translation, um, I mean, there are limitations here. The general limitations of GPT come, come in into play. 
that is kind of like a general purpose model trained on the whole of the internet. It's not really specialized towards translation. And um, for example, uh, one, one funny title of a paper that I saw recently comes to mind. The title was GPT, I think it was Chat GPT, Jack of all trades, master of none. So basically, uh, GPT models are very, very good general purpose models, but for specific use cases, there's still a lot of um, value that can be added by fine tuning them uh, on specific data sets, like for machine translation. And um, it's very difficult for a general purpose model to, to get to the point where uh, it's able to do not only um, stuff like dialogue, like chat GPT, not only solve various tasks like sentiment analysis, uh, uh, classification, summarization, anything you can think of, and get a state-of-the-art performance on machine translation. It's very difficult to get there. Certainly, I'm quite optimistic that we're going to be able to get very, very good accuracy. But in my opinion, the accuracy specifically on machine translation will always be better off using a dedicated model. Also because machine translation is a special case where you have quite often you, you want to like specialize in a specific vocabulary for a narrow domain. You want to use, uh, you want to focus, for example, on biology only. You want to use specific terminology relevant to your company um, that you want to target. We're going to see a lot of interesting use cases of machine translation using ChatGPT or GPT or foundation language models, I'm sure. But it will be very difficult to match that with a dedicated large enough model specialized on your data, I have the feeling. And I will be skeptical um, if this happens. For example, I think DeepL or so will always be better than ChatGPT uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, just because of the unique data sets that they're using for training. Sometimes I feel like when I'm playing around with ChatGPT that it goes through English as a pivot. Um, do you think that's the case? Like even if I prompted in German to do something, I, uh, blanking on kind of the specific example here, uh, but sometimes I feel it like machine translates it into English and then processes my request in English and then kind of gives me almost a machine translated German output back. Do you think that could be the case? Or like if I prompted in German or whatever other language that's not English, does it actually kind of run this in that particular language? I just sometimes, it's hard to um, kind of uh, frame this, but I feel sometimes it actually pivots into English, does what it has to do, and kind of machine translates the result back into German. Do you think that's a reasonable hypothesis or does it make no sense at all? Yeah, that's a very interesting property that ChatGPT has. Um, I've also been quite surprised. You can even do things like you can, for example, you can requ uh, request GPT to summarize an article and you can actually give an instruction like your output should actually be in German now. And ChatGPT is able to do that. And it's quite a remarkable uh, capacity that, as far as I know, only came out with ChatGPT. I'm not sure if uh, previous iterations were able to do this. I'm not sure if there's like a lot of insight into how it's able to do this. Um, there's not a lot of research data around this. Um, I think the speculation are that precisely there are, because it's a very, very deep model, what it's doing is precisely something that what you're saying. So earlier layers in the model, in the network, are handling this precise task. So they're figuring out what is the response to you in a, some sort of a, perhaps some sort of a AI language or GPT internal language. The representations are produced that are basically um, encapsulating what the output should be like. And perhaps later layers are able to kind of produce the final output, which is going to be a stream of tokens in the target language, in the target format, uh, basically handling the uh, the case that you want to be handled by the model. And um, that's kind of my intuition for this at least. And I'm sure there's a lot more to uncover regarding what those models are doing 
precisely this is one of the uh, kind of the unique properties we have seen specifically talking about large language models larger than 100 billion parameters and we don't know yet precisely why why does it happen and which type of model let's say which size which properties of the model lead to this really uh, amazing qualities that are super useful as well do you think OpenAI knows what's going on inside or they don't either or they like barely know I think they probably know a little bit more than us but not that much also from what I have seen for example I watched an interview with the uh, with the CEO of OpenAI uh, with Lex Friedman and there he was mentioning that they were also very surprised by the capacity of ChatGPT and by the popularity it gained. And I'm sure that they're also very surprised by many, many of the qualities um, we have seen and many of the amazing use cases they have done in the demos, for example, where you can do things like, also the multilingual qualities are quite impressive as well, where you, they, they uh, in the demo that they showed of ChatGPT, sorry, GPT-4, they took an image of a website and then they were able to generate the source code of the website, which was able to to be compiled and was actually doing what they wanted to do, wanted it to do. So we're kind of learning day by day. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to uncover. If I was a kind of a founder and I like the, let's say translation, multilingual content problem, what would you, what should I build? Or what do you think are like the top three, five ideas to build right now? Do you mean specifically using GPT foundation models? No, let's 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 narrow it down to these foundational models like on Cohere, on on the OpenAI API. Like you know, let's stay with that that those recent kind of advanced. Yeah. So I think there's a potential for personalization. One really cool thing about those foundation models is that. You can really personalize them on a massive scale to many people. And talking about the translation problem, for example, you would be able to target a use case where basically everyone is getting a personalized translation system, specifically for you. Let's say for you, Florian, you want to target, let's say, a very narrow use case. Let's say, let's say you want to translate the podcast in multiple languages here. What you can do with those foundation models is you can provide a bunch of examples and very quickly you can get a personalized translation system that is using your vocabulary as an example. Um, and this is an advantage over a player like, um, like DeepL or Google Translate where the personalization is quite limiting as far as I know. I'm not, I'm not really a user of DeepL Pro or similar services. They might offer something similar, but basically you will be able to build a personalized translation system much more quickly uh, with those technologies. So that's something that comes to mind. And I think there is a potential in there. I don't know in terms of the business side, what is the capacity there? Because the question there, of course, is can you actually do much better than DeepL? Because um, that is a question like, if you're not able to match at least DeepL it would be little incentive for the people to switch to those translation providers to, to your personalized system. Um, and maybe there, another idea that comes to mind that is related is going more on the multimodal space. Um, for example, in terms of translation, like translating not only text, but maybe going on the audio level, video level. Uh, perhaps this would be much more interesting with foundation models. You can also combine for example, models for, for images, for videos. Maybe you can generate videos uh, in different languages. That's where also a use case like Synthesia comes into play. Uh, this is also something that they promised on the website that they, I don't think they have looked into yet, but uh, it would be amazing. Imagine like now I'm making my YouTube videos in English, but in the future, near-term future, I will be able to generate with a click of a button a variant of my YouTube videos targeting 50 languages. And I can have 50 YouTube channels targeting uh, whatever language I want. And if I'm a big company, then I'm, then I'm basically using YouTube as a, uh, as a marketing tool, like content marketing. This could have a major impact because 
now right now I'm reaching audiences only in English because it's too prohibitive for me to be publishing blog posts and YouTube videos in multiple languages, but now I can can basically have a much larger audience. And some for some languages um, in some countries, the uh, adoption of English is not as significant, especially if it's about B2C type of products. I see that this could have a major impact. So that's those are like two ideas that come to mind. Um, regarding other ones, um, I'm not sure. Do you actually have some yourself that come to mind? No, I mean, you mentioned YouTube. So uh, uh, they did recently start um, their, their multilingual audio option is now much more broadly available, right? They used to have it only with Mr. Beast and a couple other like giant YouTubers. And now it's much more broadly available. I'm not sure if it's like in general availability. What do I mean by that? Like we don't actually have to have multiple YouTube channels in, in multiple languages. You can just switch the audio in, in an existing YouTube video, right? Uh, which then would make it much easier, even more easy to um, uh, to scale this. I, I yeah, I was asking you because I don't I don't know. I think if I started out in 2023 in like translation multilingual content generation, and I didn't have like 100 million in VC money lined up, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would build. It's uh, it's very challenging in the kind of generative part, not in the B 2 B maybe workflow. Uh, I see a lot of. Uh, potential there. Recently, there's a company that came out um, more publicly, like called Blackbird, which is kind of like a Zapier for for various language industry applications. I like that, but just on the generative uh, side, very very tough, I think, to compete because in no matter where you go, it's it's there's always already somebody else in there uh, that's been uh, more established. But yeah, that's why that's why I'm not a um, a founder, and I'm an, an observer. It depends on at what layer you want to approach this. Like there's different layers in the startup space or AI space at the moment. So one one layer is, for example, the hardware or the the more like the foundation, the foundation type of layer, where you would be competing with companies like I don't know uh, DeepL or um, uh, OpenAI Cohere, providing like foundational type of services which other people use as an API. There it's very difficult, I think, um, especially specifically on the uh, um, language translation type of services. Unless it's a very, very niche use case that nobody is really interested in somehow, that you can somehow, maybe you have domain expertise, maybe you have some custom data that you can use, maybe you have connections in this place, space and then you come in and you're able to produce a product that is somehow substantially better uh, than what those other companies are providing. That is one option that I see. Uh, another layer is the application where you kind of use those tools, those APIs, you basically call them, and you put together a novel use case. Um, maybe you also collect some data from your customers, and they're basically you're trying to gather attention and you want to be like a first mover of this technology. And honestly, there, I think it's very, very, very tough at the moment um, to build something because just because the space is very rapidly changing, um, you have tools like uh, ChatGPT plugins that just came out. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is a very interesting development. It's not available though, right? It's not available yet. I think it's also it's just like a wait list at the moment. But basically... ChatGPT plugins could potentially put out of business many of those startups that are just focusing on the application layer. They're just calling the APIs and putting together novel use cases because people can just come in and put together a ChatGPT plugin in a few weeks, which is targeting the same use case. And the plugin already has distribution power because OpenAI is having like hundreds of millions of users at the moment. And... Uh, users that are also paying for this service. And why would then someone switch to your new application if they can just use OpenAI and already integrate with this? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty complex topic, to be honest. <laughs> Very interesting uh, uh, situation at the moment.
I hope they get a better UI soon. Uh, it's incredible that they can sign up hundreds of millions of users on this like super basic UI. Um, now, so let's speculate a bit. Next three, six, 12 months, where does this go? Where do you see this going? Like, is it in 12 months from now, I will just go to my Google Docs and I'll use Bard or I don't even care if it's Bard or OpenAI or a plugin or an API. I just kind of got used to these various new cool things I can do. Or, you know, yeah, where, where do you see this going in the next three to six, 12 months? There's kind of like two scenarios that I see playing out here. And I'm not sure, I haven't made up my mind which of those two scenarios will be the most likely yet. Um, just because the space is so rapidly changing and there's a lot a lot of new stuff coming out. Basically, I can tell you about my two kind of like options that I see. Option one is the option where the main beneficiary of this technology would actually be large corporations, which are already jumping into this technology very quickly, like companies like Microsoft, Google, Adobe, uh, Duolingo. They're also, for example, integrating large language models. All of those companies are jumping on board and they'll be able to quickly integrate them into their products. And basically having this capacity, at least a basic version will be become the norm. And when this, when this happens, this will basically put out of business many of those startups that are just calling those APIs and trying to do the same, especially if they're in direct competition with what some of those big companies are already doing. It's going to be very difficult for them to compete um, because let's say I'm a big company and I'm already using Microsoft, the Microsoft suite. I already am using Teams, Microsoft uh, Office. There's no chance for me to pay an extra 50 bucks for a uh, writing assistant when everything is already integrated into Microsoft or in Google. So that's one scenario that I see. And there, the success of the smaller companies will be the ones that are really, really narrow niche use cases where the interest from the big companies is going to be much less prominent. Um, I think there's opportunity there for sure um, for this to happen. Um, so we might might see a couple of pretty big uh, companies like that that show up that are either targeting very, very narrow, specific areas, let's say, I don't know, let's say healthcare in a specific use case, uh, let's say, I don't know, summarizing clinical notes or something like that where big company like Google or Microsoft doesn't have interest jumping in. And there, there might be some uh, uh, interesting new companies getting bigger and bigger, which also need to be very fast. And they, they need to iterate. They need to collect their own proprietary data sets and potentially also come up with new technology, not just rely on APIs, because there's going to be other similar companies coming up which will want to do the same. Um, and another class of companies in this scenario, one that will be successful most likely is the, um, at least on the short term, will be the foundation language model companies. Right now, I think there's a lot of interest in just using them as they are. But on the long term, I actually think that they will be less uh, prominent, especially as people realize that ultimately, if you want to like have an edge, you need to have your own foundation language model you need to fine tune it on your own data set that you collect from your users. And this is the value. Many of those companies that are now integrating APIs as they are out of the box, will switch to looking into developing more and more of their own custom tech in the next three to six to 12 months, as many of their, uh, many of the startups, many of the competitor, their competitors start to do the same. This will be becoming the edge. And then scenario two would be, this would be, this would be scenario one where basically big, big tech uh, foundation model companies will be, will be making money, uh, will be successful from this. <laughs> but foundation models might lose power over time, potentially, unless they're able to keep up, they're able to come up with new models because also there'll be pressure from open source, uh, which is going to basically replicate what foundation models are doing, it will be more and more easier to, to basically, you wouldn't have to rely on API, but you, would, you could just download a model from Hugging Face and use that one. 
So that would, that would be scenario one. And of course, companies like NVIDIA will be profiting at the end of the day or like companies which are more fun fundamental to the whole ecosystem, no matter what, they're going to be beneficial. And they're going to benefit from the developments. Um, scenario two would be a little bit more optimistic towards the startups because, um, I mean, this technology is really rev revolutionary at the end of the day, um, at least what you can do with it. So there might be some potential really novel use cases that are basically potentially putting out, not putting out big companies out of business, but potentially creating new industries, um, which are completely different from what the big companies are doing. Here, example, for example, could come in like search um, or assistance. We might see, see, see some really innovative assistance coming out. Right now, the, our current assistants are pretty bad, like Siri and Google, Google Assistant. They're not really good. So perhaps integrating advanced um, LLM technology, like also multimodal technology, let's say images, videos, uh, dialogue, and building something really new that is completely different from what the big companies are doing at the moment could allow some companies, some startups to to uh, to be uh, to be getting an edge, which might actually give them an advantage because of their speed. They're building on building completely new products. It might create some new big companies out of this situation, rather than just. Um, the big companies benefit from this, benefiting from the situation, and then basically they uh, provide this technology to the users, and the users are yeah. So either yeah, so those are kind of the two scenarios that I'm seeing. Either big companies are benefiting, or basically the users are benefiting, and everyone is getting this technology for free sooner or later. So everyone is gonna get ChatGPT-like functionality for free within Google Docs, within Microsoft. Um, nobody is going to pay for custom software because everything is kind of covered already by, by those big companies. Or we might see even, even more innovation. So it could be that I'm kind of like short-sighted with the scenario one. And uh, basically, I'm underestimating what can be achieved in terms of innovation, in terms of new products. Because the field is changing, uh, the field is, sorry, is changing a lot every day. We're seeing new models coming out every day, multi-model models, models that can do more and more, better, better aligned. So who knows? We have to see what happens. Finally, would you sign the pause giant AI experiment letter? <laughs> do you see any risks here in the next, I don't know, in the short to medium term? Or do you think this is all a bit overdone and we're not like about to be extinguished by a super intelligent AI going rogue? I don't really see any danger of large language models at the moment. The main danger that I see is the, uh, sorry, the, the like a huge number of uh, fake blog posts or inaccurate information being propagated by this technology. That is potentially a risk um, because more and more people are using them to write blog posts, uh, to prepare materials, both for the internet, like for social media, as well as internally for companies. Students are using them to write essays and to prepare for the exams. So um, that's a risk that we might get into this bubble where we just have this garbage in, garbage out, like AI garbage in, AI garbage out situation. But I'm hopeful that at the same time, there's so much we can do with this um, and so so many possibilities that I don't think, I don't think that it's rational to kind of constrain this also because the constraint will will be difficult to enforce. There will be companies, let's say, I don't know, in maybe not, maybe let's say in the US, they're able to constrain it, but maybe in Europe or maybe in other countries, then they're not going to be able to enforce this type of constraint. So basically it will create an imbalance um, potentially. And we don't want that. We want to the technology to be to be free and to be uh to have an open market where anyone can uh, come up with a new large uh, language model um, and to to potentially outperform 
it is getting more and more difficult for smaller companies to compete in this space. So that is one concern potentially that this gap between open AI, let's say, and startups that might might have innovative ideas but they don't have the resources is gonna be it's gonna get more and more difficult. Um, but I don't really have a good answer for this. Perhaps open source will be one answer. Like we should push more towards open source models and open source software to allow anyone to uh, develop their own large language model, as well as for the small small companies to be able to, to, to build something new on their data, on top of their data that, to compete with the big companies. So unless they're able to do this, unless they have the capacity to utilize their, their data and to fine tune large enough models to compete with open AI, indeed it might be that they might end up just calling the APIs and we might end up having this kind of like simplified AI for everyone, which might not be ideal because it will limit what can be achieved in various industries. Great, well, thank you so much, Nicola, for uh, this tour uh, across what's going on in the space of large language model, a topic, of course, that's uh, on top of everybody's mind. So <clears throat> again, go to YouTube at the Global NLP Lab or head over to Nicola's website, nlplab.tech. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time today, Nicola. Thanks so much, Florian. Great to talk to you.